When the Buddha talks about the concept of self as opposed to not-self, he makes it largely a question of control. When he talks about how you can't decree that all your feelings are going to be the feelings you want, or all the perceptions, fabrications, consciousness, or states in your body are going to be the ones you want. He's pointing out that you don't have total control over these things. And that's why he says that you should regard them as not-self. Now here he's talking to a group of monks who are on the verge of awakening. Because there are other times when he talks about self as being an important factor in the practice. And again, it's an issue of control. There are certain ways in which you can have some control over your feelings. If you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to get the mind into concentration, develop a sense of pleasure and rapture. You have some control over your perceptions. You need the perceptions of the breath. And to be able to stay with those perceptions in order to get the mind into concentration. And then there are the perceptions that you use to develop wisdom and insight, all of which you have to direct for them to do their work. In fact, that's what concentration and wisdom, that's what the whole path is all about, is pushing against the fact that you don't have total control by trying to figure out well, exactly how much control do you have and what's the best use for it. The best use, of course, is to give rise to happiness. That's where you get the idea of the self as producer on the one hand and the self as the consumer on the other. The producer that does have some control over certain faculties, certain skills. And then there's the you in there that's going to experience the happiness that comes from all this. Now, ultimately, we get to a happiness that doesn't have to have a producer or a consumer. But in the meantime, the path requires that you develop both. And one of the reasons the path starts with the right view is because you want to educate that consumer. Because it's very easy for the consumer to content itself with whatever is available, whatever is at hand. And it's very easy for its ideas to get really distorted. I was reading this morning a passage by someone who's saying he, was, he didn't see what was wrong with eros or lust, and why it's classed as a kind of craving. He didn't understand that at all. And of course, I can't understand how he could say that. There is no lust without craving. And he was content with the happiness that could come from lust, and so he wasn't going to question that. So one of the reasons the path starts with right view is because you want to train that consumer to be a better consumer, to be more discriminating, to be more wise in its choice of what happiness is worth going for. Because it's the consumer who calls the shots. So it's good to open your mind to the possibility that there is an unconditioned happiness, and it's going to require that you learn how to let go of a lot of other forms of happiness. This is one of the basic principles of wisdom in that verse where the Buddha says, if you see that there's a greater happiness that comes from forsaking a lesser happiness, then you forsake that lesser lesser happiness for the sake of the greater one. Sounds like a no-brainer, but very few of us have that ability to see, on the one hand, that this greater happiness requires letting go of the other one, the lesser one, and having the intelligence to figure out how you're going to get yourself to let go of that. All too often we would have our cake and eat it too. And we'd rather not think that we can't have everything, especially in our consumer culture, which of course is driven by the producers wanting us to contend ourselves with what they can produce. We like to think that we can have it all, and we don't like to hear that there are certain things we've got to give up in order to get something that's of higher worth. But if we really want to get the most out of the Buddhist teachings, we have to take them seriously. There is a higher happiness. And if you spend all your time mucking around in everyday pleasures, everyday defilements, 
you're going to miss out on a really important opportunity. One of the passages where he has you educate that consumer is a passage where he calls taking the self as your governing principle, an important part of the path. If you find yourself wandering away from the path, he has you remind yourself, I started on this path because I saw, I saw that there was suffering in the world and I wanted to get past it. And if I go back and abandon the path, I'll be back where I was before, or perhaps even worse. As it often happens, that when people give up on the path, they get extremely cynical about the whole prospect of a path. You see this a lot with modern Dharma teachers who ordain for a while and then realize they didn't have it, and then try to spend the rest of their lives justifying to themselves why they didn't stick with the path. So I have to remind yourself, do you really love yourself when you abandon this pra practice? If you really want true happiness, this is the path you have to stick with. And as the Buddha said, even if it involves crying to the point where tears are running down your face, as long as you stick with the path, it's going to come out well. So we start with right view to get this consumer to develop better tastes. to raise its, its sights, so you're not content with just whatever daily pleasures we have. And living here at the monastery, it's a pleasant place to be. And John Lee's image is that you have to take the pleasure of living in a quiet place like this where your, your basic needs are met and crush it. In other words, sit for longer periods of time. Don't just let yourself go by whatever feels pleasant. There's a principle in, the, in one of the Buddhist suttas that he says you don't deny yourself any pleasure that's in accordance with the Dharma, but if you find that you're indulging in a particular pleasure and it's leading to unskillful qualities in the mind, you've got to practice with pain. That can either mean practicing with meditation topics you don't like, the contemplation of the body or sitting longer periods of time and dealing with the pain that comes up, as it inevitably will when you're sitting for long periods of time. So you can watch the mind as it's dealing with the pain and realize, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're going to face pain like this as life progresses, and it can probably be a lot worse. Do you have the skills to deal with it so that even though there is pain in the body, the mind doesn't have to be pained? His teachings on heedfulness, that long list of future dangers that King Ashoka even recommended, that the monks and nuns and lay people listened to and thought about every day, is a reminder that things are not going to go well all the time, and you have to be prepared. Aging is going to come, illness is going to come, death is going to come, society can fall apart. The Sangha can get split. We're seeing it happen right now. It's not really split in the technical sense, but all sorts of strange voices are appearing now in the Sangha. When things like that happen, it gets harder and harder to practice. And do you have that attainment that will enable you to live through aging, illness, and death, and all these other disturbing circumstances without suffering? Heedfulness lies at the, the base of training your consumer inside, reminding you that even though things may be going fairly well right now, your concentration might be okay, everything else around is okay, but it's not always going to be okay. And as that passage says, if you really love yourself, you're not going to content yourself with just okay. All the great Johns keep reminding us that the, the attainment of nirvana is something that's really amazing, overwhelming. It 
So don't be just an okay consumer. Be a really demanding consumer, which means that you're going to have to be demanding of your internal producer as well. And don't let the producer say, well, this is all I can do. You'll have to content yourself with this. The Buddha said that one of the secrets of his awakening was that he didn't rest content with skillful qualities as he developed them. In other words, he took them all the way. And only when they led to a happiness that really was totally satisfying did he allow himself to be content. That's the kind of internal consumer that he developed, and he sets a good example for us all.